Hi everyone, it's Peter. In this lecture, I want to talk just a little bit about art from uh, China. And in particular, we're talking about a period that uh, is described as the Song Era. Um, and this is a, a period that's mostly the middle end of the 10th century into the 12th century, the so-called Northern Song Era. Um, <clears throat> we call the Northern Song because uh, later in this period, we're going to see the incursion from the north uh, by the Mongols. And so the capital is moved to the south and we have the Southern Song with a very uh, different set of artistic priorities in many, in many regards. Um, I'm particularly interested in this, but in this talk, uh, in the phenomenal landscape painting. And we're gonna spend uh, most of the time just focusing on one particular work of art probably one of the greatest uh, items, uh, one of the greatest examples of landscape painting uh, in the history of world art and certainly in the, in the Chinese tradition. The painting I'm referring to is by an artist known as Fan Quan, the traditional title, um, which is typical of a number of works uh, in these, um, uh, among this uh, style of painting. Uh, the, title is a bit on the generic side, um, simply making a reference to features within the painting. So here we see uh, uh, the uh, title, Travelers Among Mountains and Streams. And again, the date is around uh, roughly 1000 or so um, CE. Um, if we look at the medium, uh, that also includes the format, uh, typical in the, the sort of information, caption information for paintings like this. So it's known as a hanging scroll, and a hanging scroll is a format where the um, the orientation of the subject matter tends to be vertical. Um, it's intended to be seen all at once, and this will be very different, for instance, from other formats such as album leaves or hand scrolls. Um, album leaves are just simply separate ish, um, sorry, separate scenes, uh, maybe six, eight, ten of them, often dealing with a uh, region or seasons or things like that. And the other uh, format known as hand scrolls uh, are intended to be unrolled so that the viewer never sees the entire painting um, all at one time and unrolls it across uh, space and time. It's worth pointing out that of the three, the probably most um, similar to typical uh, Western painting formats is going to be the hanging scroll. But even there, there's significant differences when we look at this particular piece. Um, it's painted in black ink and a certain amount of color, most of that having faded away. It'd be very hard to get a sense of um, much in the way of a polychrome um, effect in this. It's in the National Palace Museum in, in Taipei. Um, and so it's, I don't know if it's actually still on display because it's very fragile to paint on silk. Um, is itself an incredible uh, artistic achievement since silk doesn't allow uh, much in the way of correction or alteration as we go. But it's also very fragile and I'm sure exposed to as little light as possible. It's quite large, um, <clears throat> 206, 103 centimeters, uh, means that the height in English units is around seven feet. So it's an extraordinarily large painting by any standard. Um, and it shows a remarkable degree of finish uh, throughout, um, as we'll see in, in details. <clears throat> it represents a very typical uh, geological uh, phenomenon in uh, China that's associated with karst landscapes, namely very uh, vertical, uh, tall pillars of limestone cut through by steep ravines and gullies uh, formed by waterfalls. Um, these areas often have extensive cave systems and, and things like that, and they form a, a pretty radical um, sort of visual element that dominates uh, the scene that we're looking at. Um, some people have talked, and we'll develop this a little bit in uh, detail about the sort of spiritual and philosophical background of this, um, of this painting. Some people have proposed that the strong central element carries with it a kind of political overtone, particularly the power and stability and strength of the emperor. But I think 
uh, when we know just a little bit more about the artist and the kinds of um, views that were typical for him and artists, other artists of his time, <clears throat> the political interpretation, I, th I think, is less, less tenable than what we might describe as a kind of Taoist uh, read of it. In the world of Taoism, uh, much of it has to do with a reconciliation of opposing natural forces. And I think in the instance of the travelers among mountains and streams, the opposition between the hard, uh, theoretically unyielding mass of the mountain and the degree to which that mass is ultimately, you know, disassembled, decomposed, fragmented, but also at the same time shaped by uh, the powers, the forces of water is abundantly clear here. Water is present in a number of uh, ways. Uh, prominently on the right, of course, that deep recess with um, these thin uh, stripes uh, showing water moving through uh, that, again, that narrow gully or recess. Um, and interestingly enough, in both the waterfall and in the sort of mists that occupy the middle ground, as well as the stream that runs through here, uh, water is represented by simply an absence of, of ink. We'll come back to the monochrome piece, but it's to me very Taoist to see the presence of something be denoted by the absence of, of ink. <clears throat> so the huge mass of, of uh, rock right here, which is given a certain degree of scale by this very small temple present here in the lower third of the scene, uh, which would put this at you know three to five hundred feet in height. Um, that mass of rock is being slowly and exorably uh, taken apart by the the presence of water. So the juxtaposition of those two is a very Taoist um, concept in its own right. And the artist, in essence, focusing primarily on those natural processes in action, and underemphasizing, de-emphasizing the presence of you know, human activity, human presence is, is I, I think, another important aspect. So Fan Quan is definitely described, <clears throat> according to the biographical tradition, as an individual who ultimately becomes a kind of Taoist recluse. Uh, that is to say, an individual who retreats from the city, retreats from uh, professional achievement or placement in the imperial civil service, and instead becomes an artist who uh, really seeks to experience and then reproduce uh, the effects of, of uh, the natural world. Um, he clearly is, was an extraordinary painter. We look a little bit at some, some details here. And there's a close up of that waterfall, that sort of central rock buttress. The degree to which uh, Fan Quan came up with a vocabulary of brush strokes to handle a wide variety of natural phenomena is really quite unparalleled uh, prior to his time and really hardly equaled since. It's important to understand that the tradition of Chinese painting is preoccupied with the power, the specificity of the single brush stroke. Um, unlike uh, as became typical in uh, the Western tradition of painting, where color would be applied to a surface, be it board or canvas, and then, um, you know, a representation formed through the, you know, mass of color, perhaps shaping a little bit with brush, but ultimately, and this is very typical in much of the West until the, really going into the 18th or 19th centuries, the artist's hand is ultimately intended to be invisible. In the Chinese tradition, the brush is supreme and the mark of the brush is allowed to present itself in virtually every uh, a return. This uh, coincides nicely with the uh, calligraphic tradition, namely uh, Chinese writing with the brush. And indeed, many poems, uh, poets were quite good at uh, painting and vice versa. And of course, the presence of calligraphic dedications, inscriptions, poetical meditations um, are a very typical feature of uh, Chinese landscape painting. So you can see uh, even in this detail, but if we just go down, I think a little tighter, uh, this gives us a good sense of the kinds of uh, different strokes that might be brought into play as the artist attempted to um, build up, for instance, masses of 
uh, evergreen foliage, um, bold, uh, distinctive outline uh, strokes here to recreate with extraordinary fidelity and verism the gnarled uh, trunks of pine trees, for instance, on uh, jutting outcrops of rock, the outlines also in uh, the passages having to do with um, you know, suggesting rugged and eroded rocks one might meet in uh, uh, environments like this. Um, again, that temple to the right barely stands out at all uh, along this uh, sort of ridge that's dominated by uh, craggy pines and other trees. Uh, just to go in just a little bit more closely in the detail, you can see the extraordinary control, but also freedom that uh, the artist has used to create the forms of, of those trees to give them a sense of life. And this is another aspect of Chinese painting generally, but also speaking specifically in landscape to not necessarily reproduce exactly and specifically an actual scene, but to bring forth in the viewer's mind a sense of the kind of living spirit of uh, the natural world, uh, whether it's in animals, whether it's in uh, trees, uh, cliffs, the movement of water, all those are, you know, since we're represented by the artist as manifestations of, of spirit rather than straight visual recording. As we return to the bottom, as we turn to the bottom of the, the um, hanging scroll, you can see that those waterfalls and mist somehow coalesce into a mountain stream, which cuts with extraordinary fidelity to, you know, how these things actually work in real life. A series of small waterfalls cutting through and making a small canyon here, overhanging rocks. And uh, again, those uh, wonderfully vigorous and rugged trees, these often carried sort of poetic and even potentially political associations for viewers and, and painters alike. To the right of the stream bank that's being formed that, that exits out to the viewer's left of the painting, we see a small pack train of mules burdened down. You can see just ahead of them, again, very, very small scale relative to the rest of the painting, a leader and someone bringing up the train in the background. If you zoom in a little bit more tightly, you can see just the, you know, the actual burden that's being carried right here. Um, and uh, by the person, uh, persons to the front and back, and also the mules. Interestingly enough, hidden, just barely visible at all, is uh, character. There are a few characters that represent the artist's name hidden under these, uh, again, extraordinarily complex and vivid and vividly lifelike uh, trees. So to sum up, Fan Quan's uh, painting, let me just return to the beginning here. Let's Go back up. Foncon's painting is an extraordinary summary of the forces of the natural world. Um, again, I would suggest uh, presented to the viewer as a kind of echoing or um, evocation of Taoist uh, understanding of the operations of nature and the movement of energy through the natural world that succeeds both on a macro scale and also on a very, very tightly detailed micro scale. The fascinating thing about the piece is that, and this is present in other aspects of Chinese painting, the closer you go into uh, the scene, as it were, as I was just looking at that pack train of the mules, the harder it is to comprehend or take in the rest of the piece. So there's a sense of a kind of free-floating perspective the viewer is invited to kind of drift in and out um, without any single unified viewpoint. Uh, this kind of approach to painting gives the viewer a sense of the totality of nature through multiple sort of uh, points of view, not just, I would suggest, in space, but also in time. Uh, regardless, Von Quan's painting is a true uh, achievement, uh, not just for Chinese painting, but for world art in general as a representation of nature.